Like I would never, I would never watch a game with Pionk. Uh, <laughs> you know, Schmidt maybe I could do yeah. just because he's Cause always kind of nice. Yeah, he's yeah. always buzzed. You know, yeah. he's just in a good mood all the time. But like, I think me and P would maybe end up fighting each other. <laughs>
All right, the moment you've been waiting for. Friday afternoon, I sat down with Jets forward Mason Appleton to go over his enjoyment levels uh, since returning to Winnipeg and becoming a Jet once again, his Packers, and his New Year's Eve plans. Here's that interview. Mason, uh, after you were traded here, how long did it take you to feel fully comfortable and integrated back in Winnipeg again? Uh, really quick, honestly. Um, part of me felt like I never really left, mm -hmm. and I've... You know, I've heard the guys joke about that a lot. Like, we've totally forgot you were even in Seattle. So uh, that, that was a good feeling, honestly, hearing that as well. Uh, maybe um, for the better like that. that yes. Yeah. You know, it could kind of be erased that a bit from my from my mind. I mean, not like it was it was terrible or anything like that, but I was thrilled to be back here in Winnipeg. And, yeah, right when I got back, I, you know, felt felt right at home again. Do you still have the same – did you have the same place and everything like that? Did, no. How much did you have to change? No, I ended up – like, when I got traded back – I ended up living down in uh, Bridgewater mm -hmm. for the last for the couple months I was here, which was fine. But uh, I never lived that far away from the rink prior. So, uh, but then you know coming back uh, once I signed my last deal, then I you know bought a house in Tuxedo. So that's that's been nice. Who'd you stay in t contact with the most at, when you were with the, with Seattle here? Uh, that's a good question. You know, uh, in the summer, I think a lot of the guys, uh, you know, Lousy's obviously one of my best friends here and someone yeah. that I've always kind of stayed in contact with. So you can maybe say him, but you know, when the season gets rolling, it's, it's kind of tough to uh, really stay in contact with guys frequently. Like I'm not a guy that just texts someone. It's like, Hey, what's up? How are you doing? It's more of when something comes up kind of, cause I feel like a lot of my relationships like that, I can, you know, just pick back up where we left off with someone. It's not like we got to, you know, text each other every two weeks and check in. It's, you know, we kind of know how each other are doing somehow. And then, you know, we just pick back up where we left off. Well, how, how cool is it to walk back into the Jets dressing room when you came back? Yeah, it was, it was special. It, uh, you know, the old cliche of you never realize what you have until it's gone was kind of something when, you know, when times were a little tougher in Seattle and we were struggling as a team and guys were starting to get traded. It was like, damn, like, like I would love to be back in Winnipeg. And then, you know, it finally happens and you walk back in the room for the first time and you kind of got to pinch yourself a little bit and you're like, okay, I'm back here. This is, you know, where I belong and where I feel most comfortable. Is that something where like the same feeling you must imagine that Lauren Brassois has when he comes back? Because it's like, it felt like he probably never left either. Yeah, uh, obviously, you know, every situation is a little different. Like he's played in Edmonton as well. So yeah, like he right. was somewhere else prior where, you know, I was five years in the same spot and you know, all I knew was Winnipeg. So I guess maybe it was a similar feeling for him, but obviously he, you know, they were a Stanley Cup winning team. So uh, I don't really know. I'd, I'd be interested to, you know, ask how he feels about that. But yeah, I certainly know how it felt for me. Were your routines exactly the same, you know, your daily routines in, in the city when you came back than they were beforehand? Did you re immediately return back to your same coffee stops? And all, all, yeah, 100%. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would call myself uh, a little directionally. Like, I'm not the best at direction, so I, I kind of know my spots. <laughs> right. uh, especially then when I was coming from Bridgewater, I'm like, oh, God, I got to figure this out here. I was still maps in it, like, 15 games into being back. Not good. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I figured it out, and uh, I like what I like. You know, I'm not a big guy of changing things up, so I, I, uh, I got my spots here, and, you know, DoorDash works well, too, so uh, <laughs> I can do that, too. I got some questions for you. So, uh, true or false, back in 2014, you're around 165 pounds. It was right before you went to the United States Hockey League. Yeah, yeah. You were told to work out five days a week and consume 6,500 calories a day. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's true. Okay. Uh, yeah, I remember literally, like, I would make these shakes at night that were just packed full of, you know, everything. Raw eggs, ice cream, yogurt, milk, peanut butter. Like, I would be, like, gagging trying to get this thing down. I'm not kidding. Like... I would go to bed so full, but I think my my senior year, like when I finally was towards the end of growing, mm -hmm. I, I had a lot of filling out into my body to do. Like I'm still a pretty thin guy, but I've, you know, you when you're training hard and skating a lot, like it's tough to really put on weight. So I uh, made a big emphasis of consuming that amount of calories, which right now if I did that, that'd be disgusting and I'd probably get fat, but uh yeah, at the time it was what I needed. Is it, like, is it a is it a shake that you would recommend to other people, or you're just like that is the worst thing? Honestly, ever. no. I, I I love how like I drink raw eggs in my smoothie every morning. Right. Uh, so I think it makes it kind of creamy, but <laughs> you know, some people are like, "What the heck's wrong with you?" But uh, no, I've been I've been doing that my I don't know for the last ten fifteen years. Mm. Uh, I I don't have that same shake in yeah, the morning. Yeah. Just uh, 
much easier version of that, but uh, yeah, I always liked the flavor. Quite heavy, but right? It was just too heavy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Michigan State from 2015 to 2017, you obviously went up against Kyle Connor here and there. What did you think of him when you played at Michigan State versus Michigan? Yeah, I mean, he was he was always a stud. Like we even grew up playing against each other. Okay. And then uh, in the USHL when he was in Youngstown, I was in Tri City, so right. we, we've played each other for a long time. Um, so I knew he was a heck of a player, and then. Obviously, he was, you know, he was a first-round pick. I was a sixth-round pick. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, I mean, every time you step on the ice against him, he has that ability to make those wild plays like you saw last night mm-hmm. that unbelievable goal he scored. We're all just on the bench like, oh, my gosh, that was nuts. So, uh, yeah, it was – I mean, it's not great playing against him. It's it's great playing with him. Right. And did you did you like him? Was there, Did you know him a little bit? Or you yeah, think like, a, you know – Think of him as a person. Well, development camps are, like, such a – blur of a week almost yep. and like your first couple you are you know naturally you're a little shy or just trying to take in so much so we only got to know each other so much mm-hmm. and that's just the nature of you know a five-day camp and that's kind of it and then you know yeah we had rivals you know Michigan Michigan State but at the end of the day once once we became you know teammates here obviously that's all set aside and we're buddies now what obviously. do you think of Michigan I mean <laughs> the same as every other Michigan State guy thinks, strong dislike. That's enough there. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, 2018, you were named to the AHL All Star team. Which one of your teammates was also named to the team as well? That the All Rookie Team. Sammy Niku. Correct. Do you know anybody else that was on that on the All Rookie Team by chance? For bonus points. Ah. Uh, Dylan Strom. Th- yep. Yeah, one of the Strom brothers. Ah. Uh, uh, there's a goalie in. Uh, um, Detroit right now that was on the team. Billy Huso was oh, on that team. Yeah, yeah. Well. Yep. Uh, let's move on to other fun stuff. Rank these three Packer quarterbacks in order: Bart Starr before your time, obviously. Don't put Jordan Love in. <laughs> Bart, Brett Favre. I don't have that bad of a sense of humor. Okay, and Aaron Rodgers. Ah, uh, you know, it's kind of like the Michael Jordan Lebron thing. Like, that's not that funny. <laughs> in the sense of like, I never watched R- Jordan really play. Okay. So like my grasp on. Bart Starr yeah. isn't what, you know, someone else could say about him. So, you know, I'm a big Raj guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would have to go Raj 1, Favre 2, Star 3. Uh, obviously all three insane players that won championships. So, yeah, I, I, they're almost interchangeable, but, you know, I got a soft spot for Raj. Do you feel that the Packers have been blessed with this this quarterback play throughout their history, unlike other franchises who have scrambled for years? I can think of it as a Dolphins fan. Yeah. You have Dan Marino. You wait forever for Tua. Right. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, Green Bay, they've done a really good job of not rushing guys. Obviously, mm-hmm. you have to hit home runs in the draft as well, and they have to pan out. But you look at Aaron Rodgers, like Green Bay drafts him – all the fans are like, what the heck are we doing? You know, we still have Brett Favre. Yeah. And then it ends up being the, you know, the best play they've ever made. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's different now in the league. Like, you don't re- always have the blessing to develop a guy behind a good starter. You know, a lot of times when you have a high draft pick, it's because your starter is not good. And then you got to, f- you know, you got to force this guy into the league right, right. away. And then that can, that can kill a guy's career really early because his confidence is just deleted after one season. So I think... You know, Green Bay's been blessed in that sense. Uh, if you listen to Aaron Rodgers talk now, he and Jordan Love, like, you can tell that from their relationship, Love learned a ton from Aaron. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I hope that it can continue to translate and he can continue to get better. But at the same time, you know, I, I don't know if anybody's really Aaron Rodgers and Brett Favre. Like, it's, it's really hard to replicate. But there was, you know, a 30-year stretch between those two where it was – you know, it's. I mean, that's why it's nicknamed Title Town, and that's why they're. That's why they're great. Rank your three NFC North rivals in terms of the you hate them the most to the least. Ah, uh, four. I would say, I would honestly say I hate the Bears the least, just because we absolutely own them, so they're kind of irrelevant to us. Yeah, the little brother. Yeah, yeah. And then I would say, ah. Uh, I probably hate the Vikes the most, and then Detroit. I think I hate the Vikes the most just because when Favre went there. Yes. Um, you know, Greg Jennings went there too. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's weird how Greg didn't have a career after he left Aaron. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I would say I hate the Vikes the most. Uh, a lot of Viking fans in the Jets dressing room. How do you deal with that on a daily basis? It's tougher now that we're, we're not as good as we once were. But, uh, 
Ah, uh, yeah, I can't watch a game with them. <laughs> like the other day, who's the who's the worst person from the Viking fandom? Like I would never, I would never with? watch a game with Pionk. Uh, <laughs> you know, Schmidt maybe I could do yeah. just because he's Cause always kind of nice. Yeah, he's yeah. always buzz. You know, yeah. he's just in a good mood all the time. But like, I think me and P would maybe end up fighting each other. <laughs> but. I would prefer, like, I don't like watching games with anyone. Right. Like, I like being on my couch alone, and mm-hmm. <laughs> that's kind of it. Does so. include your, your wife not even? No, my wife, yeah. 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 Well, I get mad at her when she's not dialed into the game, <laughs> so then we'll start arguing, and then it's just me and the TV. But I like watching the game with, you The know, TV understands you. Yeah, so. yeah, it gets me. Like, <laughs> yeah. if I'm watching it with diehard Packer fans, that's great, but if, if there's any other fan or mm-hmm. anybody cheering against Green Bay, it's, I'm leaving the room, I'm watching somewhere else. Last one for you. Um, December 31st, you guys play Minnesota, and that night it's Minnesota and Green Bay on Sunday Night Football. What is – I, I just asked Brownie about it. You guys will be flying back. It should be back by 7.30, which is around kickoff time. What would that look like for you in the hurry back to your house? Yeah, well, we'll see where we are in the standings at that point. Right. There's probably a lot of talk going on on the plane. And then, mm-hmm. yeah, I will uh, – like I find a way to, you know, watch every second of those games, whether – you know, we're just getting into a hotel or something like that. I've, I've got it all dialed in with, you know, the different apps and such. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't miss too many games. Uh, and even I've – there's times, like, when we're when we're about to play, like, I'll have to have someone let me know the score. Yeah. Just because, like, not that I'm not bought into our game. It's just, like, in the back of my mind sometimes where it's, like, I kind of got to know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll make sure I'm sitting down for kickoff. Appreciate your time. Congratulations on a great start to the season. Thank you. Thank you. What are you going to do, Maddie? Maddie, what the f- are you going to do? One starts tonight, right? Hey, right. Not Perfetti pushing down behind the plate with Mahura. Hey, hey, Fritz! 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 You know, guys aren't, you know, usually seeing me drop my gloves, but uh, it's just kind of the way the, way the game went. Drop the gloves! The chunk and Mark Shumpley! Two franchise cornerstones had agreed to seven-year contract extensions. <laughs> I just kind of tried to give him the perfect handoff like a quarterback. Hi, I'm Adam Lowry. Adam Lowry with his second of the night. And this is the Ground Control Podcast. Uh, Sarah, uh, welcome back to the podcast. Um, Thanks so much for having me. It's your scheduled appearance on the, on the, on the pod, so thank you so much for showing up. Uh, you've now passed on from homecoming. You've moved on to other things such as runway, so can you take us through the latest and what you're excited about this season, about the, uh, the documentary? I am so I'm excited about so much of the content that we have going on this season. You and I have spoken about it so many times. I mean, on here, yeah. we spoke about it, but then also just on our day-to-day conversations about all the exciting things that we're doing this year. So with respect to Runway, um, we've already put out a couple of episodes for it. So after people are finished listening to this podcast or watching it, uh, they definitely want to go over to the Jets YouTube page and be able to catch episodes one and two. And if people remember that last season we started a behind-the-scenes series and had a number of episodes that followed along with the players uh, throughout the season, but this year we've changed it up a little bit and we're really following the team uh, throughout the whole schedule um, and really just trying to give people an idea of what this season is like um, at the rink and of course away as well. But we've incorporated interviews into it this Mm -hmm. year, which I think really adds a different dimension that we didn't see last season with it. We've had some great moments already. I was thrilled because episode one had, uh, we looked at a variety of different things with Adam Lowry. And then episode two, we had him mic'd up for the home opener, which if people remember the home opener, where it and everything that was- Everything happened. Everything happened. So let me tell you, I had a smile ear to ear with the fact that he was mic'd up (laughs) for it because he figured in so prominently into that game. But those are the sorts of things that we're going to be doing all season long to be able to give Jets fans more access to the players, both what we've seen happen on the ice, but then be able to get to know them more off the ice as well. I think the the best part of uh, episode two is the assist, which is Josh Morrissey handing off his stick on the goal that led to handing the stick to Adam Lowry on the odd man rush, shorthanded goal by Mason Appleton. That must have 
have been something where you're like, thank you very much. That was it. It was all really throughout that entire game. I kept messaging down to um, the guys that were shooting it going, please tell me the mic's still working. Please tell me the mic's still working. Um, but something like that is great. And, you know, you never obviously know when uh, when something like that's going to be able to happen. And so we just lucked out with it. But to be able to then hear the players talk about it afterwards with it and give some more context to it, I thought was really great. And, again, to be able to hear Adam on the bench after Sis go, oh, I thought it was Vladdy's stick. And you just be able to hear different elements that you weren't able to get just from being able to watch the game. I imagine the uh, conversation between him and Matthew Kachuk was something. It was must-see TV that, of course, we can't show a lot of, but there was enough in there, right? There was enough it abso- enough meat on the bone on enough that Enough that you absolutely want to make sure that you watch episode two for it. Yeah, it's it was very entertaining. How's the players' reception to all of this? I mean, last year was new for them and then this year's a whole new new set of uh, questions and conversations yeah I think that they've really I think that they've enjoyed it um at least the feedback so far has been positive we've tried to again demonstrate to them the benefit of having the interviews in it and I think that after watching episode anyone that's watched episode one and two would be able to see it and be able to tell the stories better and you're able to see more much like when you and I had discussed before home ice and trying to get to know guys away from the rink a little bit better and yeah. see their personality, the opportunity exists here to be able to see some of their personality as well with it. So I think it's just, it's another opportunity to be able to get to know the players better. And so far the players have been embracing it. That was a shameless promotion of the other things you were working on with home ice. That's <laughs> nicely done how you fit that in there. So uh, you know, you, you've had Josh Morris. <laughs> Not my first rodeo. <laughs> yeah, so you know exactly what you're doing when you do these things. Um, Josh Morris, you sat down with him with home ice. What, what is the basic gist of the home ice? You talked about it a little bit, but just getting players away from the rink is, I guess, is yeah, and and that's it. Is trying is showing guys with their connection to um, Winnipeg and just being able to learn more about them. I think one of the things that I've seen is that so often we hear from the players talking about what's going on on the ice and in their play, but to be able to get to know them more away from the ice, there's so many good personalities on this team that you don't necessarily get to see on a day-to-day basis when you're just listening to scrums or you're just being asked you know, about the upcoming game or, or the game that just finished. So that's what we're trying to do here is just be able to show, again, a little bit more personality from the guys so that fans are able to learn more about them. So you've had Josh Morrissey. Who's your next upcoming guest list? Uh, we have also something with Morgan Barron, with Adam Lowry. We've got something coming up with Dylan DeMello and, and some other guys coming up uh, in the future as well. So I'm really excited with the way that – the way that things have started with it. It it kind of works well that you came on the podcast. We had Mason Appleton on a little bit earlier this week, and I just wanted to ask you about your Green Bay Packers. I really wish you wouldn't. Well, okay, (laughs) we'll move on from that. But uh, So let's move on to the next order of business. The Grey Cup is this Sunday. You could ask me about the Packers. I'll talk about them. I like to poke sore spots with you. You used to go to the Grey Cup and cover it all the time. You're no longer doing that because you're busy doing what you're doing now. Sorry about that. But um, just you have to have some great stories over the years of – just how fun behind the scenes Grey Cups are. That's, so if you think about the whiteout parties and what it's like, to, I've never been fortunate enough to be able to be out there on the streets and be able to be in the middle of that out. But to me, I look at it and think that that's kind of, if the whiteout party were to happen over multiple days in a row mm, yeah. <laughs> in a different city all the time, that's what Grey Cup is like. I mean, it's just, it's a great party. It's To me, it's the ultimate of Canadiana. Mm-hmm. You see people from across the country and having covered the Grey Cup for so many years, it, it's amazing to me how many people you recognize year to year that really that plan their vacations around going to Grey Cup. And so there's something to me that's, so unique and also so wonderful both being able to walk in and you see someone you know maybe wearing a hoodie and jeans and I'm able to look and go oh that right there he's an Owls fan and I know that because I've seen him at every Grey Cup for the last of years and and it's just it's it is a tremendous time people come and and just celebrate really Thursday through Sunday. <laughs> and so, like, it's in Hamilton this year, but you've been to plenty of great cups that were not so warm. I believe the Edmonton one was the coldest one, right, in 2000? I 
think so. Minus they, 30, I think it was, after the game was over. For it, I don't... How I many times, like, interviews cannot be fine on the sidelines when you're doing... They're the not, yeah. no. In fact, you know what, since... So TSN started, the first Grey Cup that TSN um, broadcast was 2008. And I always say that we have been so... Or we were so fortunate that all of the years, even if there, even if it was snowing, it was never bitterly, bitterly cold. Mm. Um, the often the West Finals were worse in terms of temperatures than what we had for the Grey Cup. Um, but certainly that by the end of it, you just you're talking to guys, and at that final moment, I mean everybody's so happy that yeah. it doesn't matter, and so they can't they can't really feel how cold it is. <laughs> but certainly, you know, by the end, I'd often have my face tucked under my scarf, trying to just make sure that my mouth hadn't frozen up because if you have spent any time outdoors for an extended period of time, I mean, we'd spend hours, you know, on the average, about six hours, six and a half hours outside. Talking is challenging. It talk is very challenging. And so there's no, there's nothing worse than when you go to say something <laughs> on camera in front of millions of people. And as you're speaking, you're thinking, I don't actually think that anyone can understand what I'm saying right now because yeah. my lips aren't moving because my face is just stuck. Do you miss it? Um, oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the, you know, there's something about live TV period, but with the Grey Cup um, in particular, said you just, it's that it's a game seven all the time, right? So it's just, you see people at their highest highs and unfortunately, we often, or we'd always go in and speak to the um, losing quarterback and coach as well, which I had to do on a number of occasions. So you either get guys at their highest highs or their lowest lows. And so it's a real, it runs the gamut of it, but it's, it's a really special, it's a really special event in a great league. Appreciate your time. Hey, anytime. I look forward to being back on again. <laughs> your scheduled time slot. Yes. <laughs> yes. Always. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much to all our guests here on Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. That'll do it for this week. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.